Uh, my name is Carol Wanjao. I'm a pastor and also a marriage and family therapist. And I'm so excited to be welcoming you to this third installment of a video series that is trying to answer the question of why. Uh, why is it that families have been, you know, some families have been hit so severely by COVID while others not as much, you know, but even much more important is what to do. What should families in crisis uh, be doing at this time to alleviate their stress level? So I'm so excited that you could um, that you could join uh, in this session. I want to first of all tell you thank you so much uh, for your participation. I have noticed that there have been quite a number of shares um, in their previous uh, video uh, series, and I'm so, uh, and I want to just say thank you, thank you so much for sharing this. Um, and let us share these talks, especially with people we know, you know, need to hear, you know, uh, the, to hear, to, to be part of uh, these conversations. It could be your family members, it could be your friends, it could be your colleagues, you know, anybody who would benefit. Let us just share hope at this time. And so I really appreciate that you've been uh, sharing. I also want to thank you so much for your questions, for your comments. Uh, even for your feedback um, uh, during this time. I want to encourage you as you join, please say where you're coming from. I want to say even if you're coming from Ongata Rongai, you're most welcome uh, to this uh, video series. And as usual, I want to begin with some of the questions that I have received uh, during this time. And, and I have two of them, I've selected two of them. And uh, the first one is, uh, Dear Pastor Carol, Thank you for the word you preached when you talked about foundations. I loved the steps you outlined and especially the ones on ceasefire, uh, and that is being civil to one another. So what do you do if your spouse does not follow the steps and still continue in their old ways? And that is someone going by the initials WM. Uh, the second uh, comment uh, was um, uh, uh, is, uh, Dear Pastor Carol, in your talk, you mentioned the need to only deal with one issue at a time. But what happens if your spouse is an escape, is an escapist? In fact, they had said escape artist, and they feel justified to not face any of the issues at all. And this is coming from someone, uh, MO. Thank you so much, WM and MO. You know, I am so sure if we were to ask people here to raise their hands and to ask, you know, how many of us feel you, uh, quite a number of hands uh, will go up, although I don't think it's really advisable if your spouse is sitting next to you. But what I'm trying to say is that you're not alone. We feel you. And um, I want to say that as we watch these videos, uh, we are on a path. We are on a path of rebuilding foundations. Uh, you know, when we come into marriage, we basically come in with quite a number of flows. You know, our understanding of what marriage is, is, is flawed. Our understanding of even how to manage finances once we are married is flawed. How to parent, roles that each person should play, our communication, all these are flawed. And they are flawed at our foundational level. And by foundation, what I mean is that these flaws are part of our personality. They are, they are part of us. They are almost like our blind spots. Um, they are part of us by virtue of the fact that we are all fallen. We are fallen human beings who have been raised by fallen parents. And so it is inevitable. It is completely inevitable that when we come into marriage, every one of us comes with flawed uh, foundations. So the video series has been, you know, just taking us through a, a journey of restoration. It's what I'm calling marital coaching or marital counseling. It's a journey of, of, of bringing restoration in the ways that we relate. Uh, a restoration, you know, in the last video, we talked about a restoration of our emotional intelligence. So, so far we have talked about two crucial building uh, blocks uh, as we restore or as we repair our, our emotional uh, intelligence. Now, the first block was our topic in our first video where we talked about the importance of being proactive rather than reactive. And we said that in any crisis, it's not just in COVID times, but in any crisis, uh, uh, you have to be proactive to avert impending doom uh, in your family, it, it does not help, and, and uh, you're, you're preventing this impending doom irrespective of any action or inaction that your spouse uh, takes. So we said that looking over your shoulder, you know, to see what your spouse is doing is not helpful during a time of crisis. Uh, and so you need to do whatever it takes to ensure the safety 
and the viability of your family. So that was the first video. And then in the second video, we talked about the second building block. And this one is a skill that, you know, uh, we were introducing. It might not be so common uh, to many of you, but it was the whole skill of introspection. Okay, and we had said that introspection uh, is the ability to look inward um, and in a bid to understand the forces that are shaping our thinking. And, and, and we said that, you know, without this skill, then you're left with no option uh, but, you know, to, to feel powerless. Uh, everything, you know, is coming at you and you feel powerless and you feel helpless. And, uh, and we had said that one of the things that happens when you do that is that you blame others. You tend to really blame others. You're not able to take responsibility, but you blame others and especially your spouse for all the misfortune, you know, that you could be going through. And so introspection helps you to not only understand yourself but it also empowers you to change uh, so uh, and and that is why we were saying it is so so important that you're able uh, to in introspect so so then these are in a nutshell the conversations that we have had so far you know in the previous uh, two videos and if you haven't managed you know to watch them I'd encourage you to do so because this is like a continuation it's a continuation and it's a build-up from those first two videos and um, uh, I'd also say if you have watched, but you haven't done the personal activities that have been suggested, I would say, please do that. Please do that. Uh, this is part of your coaching. This is part of your counseling. And it, it requires you to do some homework. <laughs> I think anybody who works with me for any short amount of time knows that I give homework. But this homework is really to coach you and to help you, um, you know, and to empower you as, as we're moving forward. Uh, so today we are continuing along our path. Of what I've said is a restoration of our foundations as far as our emotional intelligence is concerned. And today we're going to be talking about some two very important uh, values, two very, very important values that, are, that really underpin our marriage. And that is respect and empathy. You see, our ability to relate well with our spouse is undergirded by our ability to be compassionate to them or to have empathy for them as well as our ability to be respectful towards them. And that is absolutely vital. I, I don't know how much more I can emphasize, but it's so vital that you're able to have respect and empathy uh, for your spouse. Now, as, as I begin, I, I want to, you know, just ask you a few questions, a few introspective questions. Uh, and these questions always, a lot of times I will go back to your family uh, of origin because, again, that is where we said our foundations are built. And I want to, I'll just ask a few questions. And, I, and the first one is, did you have empathy for one another in your family, amongst your siblings? Was there empathy uh, for one another? Uh, could you be vulnerable about your weaknesses and, and receive empathy? You know, were mistakes? How did your family respond to failure? You know, how did your family respond to weaknesses? Um, did you receive empathy? Um, were you ridiculed? Were you put down? Or were failures and, and, and mistakes seen as learning opportunities? Um, how did your parents treat each other? Was there respect there? Was there uh, empathy, compassion between them? How, how did they treat their own parents? You know, um, again, you know, how, how did that, what, what was going on uh, in your family in respect to empathy and respect? Now, uh, someone shared with me <laughs> that for them, the attitude at home, especially when someone made a mistake, was that you should know. In fact, the thing was, don't ask any questions. Don't ask me about these things. You should know. And, and this person happened to be a firstborn. And uh, I know that for many firstborns out there, many of you may resonate uh, with this phrase, you should know. And, and what to you if you're a firstborn son? You know, I, I cannot even imagine how that might have been like if you came from, uh, you should know, uh, kind of family background. And um, yet another person shared with me uh, that for him, his father saw him as a failure. He, he saw him as a failure. You know, the, this guy used to struggle with his grades. And at one time, his father actually told him to his face that he would not amount to much. You know, I, I, that's, I, you can imagine how crushing those ones can, can be, especially coming from a parent and more so a father. And, and so this guy was telling me, 
that as a result, he really did become unsure and, and insecure about his uh, abilities. And consequently, as an adult, he's not been able to hold down a job for very long or even advance in his career. So you can see, you know, there are many things that we come with from our families of origin. You know, these are foundational issues that impact, you know, how we view ourselves and therefore how we enter into marriage. So, uh, and interestingly, uh, now when it comes to the way we respond to our spouse's sin, uh, to their moral failure, to their weaknesses or even shame, uh, I want to say that we will most probably respond the same way that we did as our families of origin. We'll basically respond in those ways. And I want to suggest uh, and to kind of summarize as two ways in which we do that. Uh, and uh, for that, I want us to, to kind of reference a story in the Bible, which is coming from Genesis 9, 22 to 24. And I want to say that there are two ways as we look at this, as, at this passage. The first is like Ham, and the second is like his brothers, Shem and Japheth. And I want us to read so that we can see how these guys responded. Now Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of the wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his brothers outside. I, I can imagine him saying, by the way, you know, you cannot imagine what happened. You know, dad is out there, he's drunk and he's completely naked. I mean, I can imagine that kind of a conversation. Uh, but Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. And then they walked backward and covered their father's naked body. In fact, their faces were turned the other way so that they could not see their father's nakedness. And the passage here says uh, that when Ham saw his father naked, he talked, when we look at Ham's response, he talked to his brothers about it. And, 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 and when we look at Ham, uh, it's, I mean, we see, you know, our typical responses in that. And what normally happens is that our typical response when we discover our spouse's inadequacies, you know, we will sometimes gossip, we will criticize, we will blame, we will put down, we will mock, you know, and sometimes we'll even show contempt. And um, the way that this uh, expresses itself is, is very interesting. Uh, uh, and and it depending on your communication style. So uh, the spouse who is very open and, you know, loud in their communication, the spouse whom we said is more communicative than the other, who we had even called, you know, the aggressor, they are likely to be quite vocal in their display of displeasure with their spouse. And, and they will be very vocal about that. Uh, but the more passive spouse, you know, the one who is not as communicative, they are likely to display their displeasure uh, through their attitude or through their behavior. You know, uh, they may have, they may just have an attitude of contempt. Uh, they may choose to go kneel by mouth as they not talk to their spouse at all. Or sometimes they may even choose to get violent, you know, in a, in a bid uh, to feel less powerful and to take control of the situation. So both kind of communicators, the aggressor and the passive aggressive, they will, they, they still respond in these ways uh, as the ways that uh, Ham does. But when we look at Shem and Japheth, they, they responded quite differently. And this is what I like about Bible stories. You get to contrast, you know, uh, how people behave. And the Bible says they took a garment and walked backward while turning their faces away, lest they see their father's nakedness. And, and then they covered their father. And, and, and here are a few things that I want us to note. Uh, you will note that they did not ignore the fact that their father was naked. Uh, meaning that there is in no way are we saying that you ignore your spouse's nakedness. We're not saying you ignore their nakedness or you ignore their sin or you ignore their inadequacies. But what is noteworthy for us as we look about uh, Shem and, and Japheth uh, is that despite their father's drunken and dishonorable behavior. Shem and Japheth instead chose uh, to be honorable in the manner in which they, treat, you know, uh, they treated him. 
And the question is, at, at this point, what is it about them that made it possible for them to respond differently? Because you see, the issue, the reality is that in marriage, the issue is not the challenge that the couple is facing. The issue is normally the way we choose to respond to that situation. Uh, and I, I, to illustrate this, I, I, I do want to share with you today a real life story uh, from a couple who, despite facing challenges in their marriage, overcome by, by, overcame by choosing to respond uh, differently. And for the sake of protecting their identity, I'm going to call them Angela and Derek. Angela and Derek met, you know, while they were in college and they were attracted to each other, you know, for various reasons. Uh, for Derek, he was attracted by Angela's outgoing character and ambition, you know, she was quite ambitious. Whereas Angela was attracted by Derek's fun and easygoing nature, you know, as it goes, you know, opposites normally attract. Uh, but about five years into their marriage, things began to fall apart. Angela's ambition led her, you know, to getting promotions, uh, climbing up the corporate ladder and earning a lot more than, than Derek, her husband. And um, in the meantime, Der Derek was in the process of building, you know, his business. And so, you know, it takes, understandably, it just takes a longer time building a business compared to uh, climbing up the corp uh, corporate ladder. Now, for Angela, you know, when they were getting married, her expectation was that her husband would be the primary, uh, you know, primary provider for the family. But this was not happening. Uh, and, 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 so, and so you realize that as her social status went up, that of her husband, you know, kind of remained behind. And she started noticing that she was becoming ashamed of inviting her husband, you know, to the uh, staff event or to corporate events. You know, you know how that goes when you're uh, having a corporate event, you're asked, you know, so what are you doing? You know, all that kind of the thing. I don't know if her husband would say had too much to show for what he was doing. And so she started becoming ashamed of her husband and indeed ha having a disrespectful attitude uh, towards him. But what checked uh, Angela was remembering what happened to her parents. You see, just like her, her own mom, uh, you know, in the little farming that she was doing, uh, and a lot more than her father. Uh, but Angela's mom made sure everybody knew about it. You know, her mother's aggression, contempt, disrespect, and disregard for her father was so ugly uh, for Angela that even as a child, she decided she would not go that way. And so, you know, as I talked to Angela, I did ask her, so how is it? How, how did you climb out of this? You know, you are saying that you're struggling with being disrespectful, you know, looking down at your husband, you know, that had begun to creep in. So what did you do? How, how did you get out of this? And, 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 you know, she shared with me, you know, just a few things that I want to share with you. And, and the first thing she told me is that she stopped nagging and criticizing. She did. And, and she realized that nagging and criticizing were not helping the situation. If anything, that was pushing her husband further away. So that's the first thing that she did. And then the second thing is that she decided to focus on her husband's strengths rather than dwell on his weaknesses. And, and, and she realized that, you know, with time, she came to realize that her husband was, you know, quite risk averse when it came to, you know, uh, uh, he was quite risk averse. And when it came to making decisions and especially uh, investments, then he would take such a long time uh, to make that decision. And so, so many investment opportunities passed them by. And that really, really frustrated Angela. And so as she prayed about it and as she thought about it, you know, she decided to do things differently. And so this is what she decided. Uh, rather than ask, if they should do a certain venture together. Uh, Angela, uh, you know, uh, decided that I will invite him instead to join me. And, and what she would do is that uh, she would do her research, uh, find out, you know, this is the investment opportunity, uh, find out, you know, from her friends or whoever that she needed to find out from, you know, is this viable? And so she was able to present those facts, you know, to her husband and say, look, you know, I've done this research. These are the, this is the investment opportunity. You know, this is the kind of research that I have done. I believe that this is a wonderful opportunity for us to take advantage of. Would you join me? Uh, because I truly value your input. 
Uh, and so what she did in all that was that she moved the conversation from, can we start? If it was a farming project, can we start? To rather, can you join me? And with that, she really did, um, uh, you know, explain to her husband just how valuable he was and how valuable his input was. And because of that, um, they have been able to make significant, very significant investments. Uh, but much as that may sound now rosy and easy in retrospect, Angela confessed that the first thing that she had to do with her was deal with her heart. She had to come out clean and confess the disrespect that you know had begun to creep in, uh, that she had started towards her husband. And when she did that, only then were her eyes opened and she was able to embrace her husband. Indeed, she was able to see his strengths. As she began to see that he's so good in accounting, he's so good in putting up systems in HR, he's so good in you know, standardizing their operations, you know, skills that Angela did not have and which were very beneficial to their business. And the amazing thing, if you are to meet this couple now, it is so difficult to tell, you know, who the originator of the investment opportunities are uh, because both Angela and her husband are fully engaged and have bought in uh, into their family business. That's what the Bible calls wisdom. That is what we are calling emotional intelligence. Uh, Proverbs 15.2 says, The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly and so in this season this is what we are saying do not stir up anger do not gush out folly uh, in other words do not take do not talk rashly take your time pause think but do not you know be so quick to speak or so so quick to anger now i know you know there are some of you who could be out there and you're asking you know you recognize my goodness i have made some mistakes uh i can tell you know um i've made some very foolish decisions i have you know put down my spouse i have actually even cut them down and you're asking what practical steps can you take even beginning this week to correct the situation you recognize things are not right you want to change and i'd like to share with you a few steps uh to 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 correct that and I'm going to give you the acronym of STEP just to help you remember. And, the and so S uh, stands for STOP. Stop disrespecting your spouse. This is a huge marriage killer. And especially when your spouse fails to meet your expectations. Now, this was the turning point, as I had mentioned, for Angela. As the aggressor in the, relationships, in the relationship, she learned how to honor her husband and to appreciate him for what he was able to do or for what he was able to give rather than what he could not do. And learning to see your spouse, no matter you know, who they are, as a person who God has gifted uniquely, you know, God has gifted them. Uh, God has given them certain skills. God has loved them. Once you change your attitude and you see them in that way, then it will help you appreciate what they are able to give as a gift, you know, something to be appreciated rather than demanded. And this goes for both husbands and wives. So that is stop, S, uh, S for stop. The second uh, is T uh, for time. Make time for your spouse. This is the only way you get to support one another. I mean, in these times uh, of COVID, I know, you know, I think we are, I don't know that we're going to, how quickly we're going to go back uh, to, to our regular rhythms. But I want to say, I don't, even when we go back to our regular rhythms, put a schedule uh, in your time, include couple time, include a time to spend with your spouse. Uh, there's, there's someone who was sharing with me and, and they were telling me that this is what has saved their marriage. Um, I, her husband lost his job. And she was getting very frustrated because you know she was not sensing much uh, direction uh, from him but as they set time together in an unhurried fashion without any agenda you know they've been able to come up with ways of 
you know, uh, uh, structuring their resources. They've been able to agree on which uh, cost to cut. Uh, they, and, and they have a good, you know, a survival uh, strategy going forward. So, you know, create a rhythm that includes um, a couple time. That's T. Now, E stands for emotional connection. Uh, 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 make it intentional to emotionally connect with your spouse. Remember, your spouse is your friend. <laughs> they are not your adversary. And, and, and uh, set times when you have a, a friendly environment, a, a time when you will talk. As I had said in previous videos, it's not just to talk about kids or even to talk about, uh, um, you know, the bills that are outstanding, but it's really just a time to have fun together. You know, watching a movie, taking a walk, but really spending a couple time together. And when you do get to discuss, you know, you know the real issues, uh, whether it's bills and investments or whatever, agree on some ground rules. We agreed as a couple on, on some ground rules, you know, very early on in our relationships. And some of the ones that we had was don't hit below the belt, you know. Do not say hurtful things that you're going to regret uh, later on. Uh, and then agree to allow each other the freedom to air uh, your views or even to complain without the other person uh, getting defensive. For the person who is the aggressor, the one who, you know, communicates, is the communicator, I want to say learn to tame your tongue. You, you really do need to learn to tame your tongue, you know, to be slower to speak. And, and, and like, you know, it is normally what gets you into trouble, you know, just talking so rashly. And if you fail, you know, to tame your tongue, then you fail to provide a, a, an environment where your uh, passive aggressive spouse feels safe enough to talk about the issues that are really uh, in their heart. Now for the less expressive spouse, whom we've called the passive aggressive spouse, then you will need to learn to tell the truth in love. You, you really do have to learn how to do that. In fact, pray about it. Uh, and it is really crucial that you learn how to communicate your needs and your feelings. Because when you fail to do that, you end up harboring unforgiveness and bitterness. And so that's E uh, for emotional connection. And then P is pray. Pray and fast for one another. Where you notice your spouse is naked and vulnerable, you know, maybe they're struggling with addictions, maybe they're in certain compromising you know, situations, Maybe if they suffer from uh, indiscipline or a need of developing certain moral and ethical con convictions, rather than quarreling them or looking down on them or disrespecting them, cover them with your prayers and with your fasting. Um, we saw earlier that for Shem and for Japheth, they treated their father honorably, even when he did not deserve it. And truth be told, when God calls us, when Jesus called us, he treated us honorably or he treats us honorably even when we do not deserve it at all. Uh, there's uh, this verse uh, which is really nice, uh, which I really like. It's uh, Romans 5.8 and it says, But God shows his love for us in this, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We do not deserve God's love. Our spouses do not deserve our love either. We love them because God loves us, even when we are unlovable. So this then is the kind of love that God responds to. And I think when, when we behave this way, when we allow respect and empathy, uh, when we you know, uh, do not um, respond in kind to our spouse, I believe that this is the kind of love that attracts God into our marriages and into our relationships. I think when God sees a spouse laying down their lives for the other, it greatly honors him and compels him to come down and redeem that situation. And that is what, uh, that is what we want for our marriages. As I conclude, I would like us to pray. Uh, but before I do so, I want to say, you know, keep up your comments, uh, keep your questions coming. Would love to interact with you, always love to interact with you. If you have any feedback, we're really open to that. And I also want to extend this invitation. If you're not part of the Mavuno community and you would like to be part of the Mavuno community and to receive prayer and support you know, from one of our pastors, uh, click on the uh, link below uh, to join the WhatsApp community. 
indicate that you'd like prayer. Also indicate where you live so that the pastor near you will call you. And if you found this content helpful, please share with your friends, with your families, and with your colleagues. As I conclude, in the, as I did in the previous two videos, I've introduced to you a little book. It's called The Negativity Fast, and it is written by an amazing woman. She's a friend of mine. She's called Dr. Geneva. She's actually a HR, uh, you know, a consultant. And um, I found just her thoughts. You know, she wrote this book on, on a negativity fast, and for her, she was like, my goodness, I really, uh, I, I really do need to get on her negativity fast over some of the situations that she was going through. And so she put together her thoughts into a book, and I found this very, very helpful. So uh, she says um, on, uh, on, on page five, she says, um, let us fast from the thought that it can't work. For some of you, even as I have been talking, perhaps your marriage has been in such a toxic situation that you're thinking this cannot work. But what this book is saying is that let's fast from that thought that it cannot work. And instead, she makes a, there's a recommendation here. It says step out of the room, the room of your past, the room of your thoughts, your upbringing, and even your expectations. Just step out of those that room uh, perhaps you've had certain expectations of your spouse that have not been met and you know you've been very bitter about that and very angry about that and the recommendation here is step out of that room step out of it uh, perhaps even as we've been talking about you know foundations you recognize oh my goodness there are huge uh, gaps in my foundation just from the family of background that i'm coming from and the recommendation is here is step out of your past step out of that room step out of out of your upbringing step out of even your expectations and as i pray that is what i want us to do to embrace that with god nothing is impossible to embrace the fact that we can invite jesus to step in in fact i love the fact that uh, in one of the stories uh, uh, with jesus there's someone who said uh, help me believe i do not have the faith but help me believe and jesus did not turn them away and so even now Jesus does not turn you away when you feel that this is a very hopeless situation. And so I'd like us to just close our eyes so that I can pray. Uh, Father, I thank you. I thank you, Jehovah God, even as we have had this conversation, the last thought that we have is to step out. Step out of our family, uh, of our upbringing. Step out of our bitterness. Uh, step out of our disappointments. Step out of even our expectations. And as we do that, Lord, you encourage us to invite you to come into these situations. And so, Father, with today, I, I really just pray that you come into those situations that have been painful or have been disappointing for us. Uh, we kind of just surrender them. I surrender them uh, to you, praying that you will step in and take over and do what you're best at, which is bringing healing and deliverance for us all. So, Father, as we go through this video series, says we are trusting you. We are trusting you, Jehovah God, that you're going to bring our much-needed transformation, our much-needed deliverance, our much-needed healing. So, Father, we entrust these situations to you as we step out of them, and we do so with faith. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So that's all that we have had time for today. Uh, until next time, I'm so excited, and I wish you just an amazing week.